Thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk about how to negotiate the deal. Plus, we got a COVID-19 update, and we will not have the president on anymore. <laughs> uh, so normal disclaimer stuff. Please, please uh, take a second to... Can you put your screen back up, Dan? Put your screen back up. Oh, is it not up? I'm not sharing. I'm seeing you. All right. There we go. All right. So All right. thank you, everybody. Uh, this is like the, the, we, we have more problems with Zoom in the first five minutes of this than I had in like two years of uh, using it. So um, anyway, it, it's our normal legal disclaimers uh, are up here and uh please please any any investments uh, do your own due diligence and uh um just just take a second or two to to read through this if you have any questions about it you can pop a question in the chat without further ado i'll let sunil introduce himself for those of you who have not met him yet. <laughs> All right, Dan, thank you very much for, uh, for getting us started off here. Again, sorry everybody for the technical difficulties, but uh, let's see if we're, let's see if we're over the, the hump on, on technical difficulties. Um, yeah, basically, um, I think a lot of you have gotten to know me over the last couple of months. Uh, I am a former uh, emergency room doctor, so if you want, we can talk COVID-19 after the meeting, not right now. <laughs> uh, but I'm really an entrepreneur. I've started a number of successful companies. I've been active in the DC uh, real estate market specifically uh, since 2001, so completed over 100 projects. Uh, there you can see my, my current companies that I run. Uh, they're all real estate related. Uh, Saxena Custom Homes is my home building company. Uh, the Saxena Company is all the commercial stuff I do. And uh, Saxena Construction is a construction activity that, uh, that I've done involved with. So. Uh, that's me, and I'll turn it back over to Dan. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I have been in real estate since 2011. Prior to that, I was a Navy nuclear engineer, and I did some work on uh, submarines, the Pentagon, and then the, I was a defense contractor for a few years. I sold $22 million in my first year of real estate, which I later wrote a book about, and uh, with Sunil and Carrie and some other partners, I've been involved in uh, over 300 homes that we've developed. Uh, married to my amazing wife, Carrie, I have three kids. She's right here with me. And uh, I do Ironman and ultra marathon competitions. And we're training for one for, for someday. I have no idea when the next one ever will be again, but uh, I'll, I'll be ready. I'll let Carrie, uh, chat now she is right there hey guys i hope you are all having a wonderful night um i struggle when i can't see your faces so i'll just tell you a quick overview about me and then look forward to connecting as we talk yeah i like it so much better when i get to see everybody um so a little bit about me i started my real estate career selling new homes and then transitioned into general brokerage kind of by accident and ended up um thinking I had a $50 million investor to do business with and being a traditional real estate agent. So over the last few years, we've grown a huge team and had a ton of success and really enjoyed growing even in the last few weeks. So I'm excited we get to talk about that tonight as well. Yeah, I'll go back to the uh, our slides here. All right, so a little bit about our team. Uh, for you real estate agents out there or people thinking about a career in it, we are the highest selling team in the DMV. We've sold over 400 million in the last uh, year, in the last 12 months. This year, our goal is to, to get that to over half a billion. It'd be a little bit more of a challenge with what's going on, but we think we're well positioned still. We'll talk more about that later. Um, if you do want to learn more about our team, you can go to carryshowcareers.com and find out more there. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about two different projects that we are 
raising uh, funds for. So the first one is a 10 unit. This is not the, uh, the, the actual building itself, but I'll let Sunil talk a little bit about it. It is located just a block off of Wisconsin Street in Tinley Town. We've got a couple, uh, a couple different spots left for people that want uh, to, to invest. So I'll let Sunil uh, chat just a little bit about what we're doing with the uh, 4050 Chesapeake uh, up in Tinley Town area. Yeah, did you want to go over the investor highlights or do you want me to go over this one and then and the, the project itself? I, I think this is our only slide about it is we just wanted to keep it kind of brief and, and then let people contact okay. us after if they had questions. So. Okay, yeah, it's, it's a project, uh, 4050 Chesapeake. It's um, in uh, the Tenley Town area, as Dan mentioned. Uh, we're taking an existing building. We're converting it to 10 condominium units. Uh, it's really uh, one of my favorite projects because of, well, first of all, of location. Uh, it's in one of the top you know, areas of DC. Those of you on the call uh, definitely know the area very well. Um, near American University, it's less than a quarter mile from Metro, it's near Whole Foods. I mean, pretty much every box you can check, the location checks that box. Uh, it's very close to Wisconsin, but it's off of Wisconsin, so it's kind of nice that you're, you're kind of right there, but you're not like right on Wisconsin itself. Um, we've got, um, like I said, 10 units. Uh, the top units will have rooftop decks, uh, high-end finishes. Um, I think one of the reasons I like it because there's not a lot of inventory in that area, condo inventory. Uh, there's just not a lot to sell in that price range. So I think this project is going to do very, very well. Um, and, you know, any, any further details, I think Dan will have a, a contact uh, uh, email or something on there as far as... Um, uh, if, you, if you want more information, how to contact us. Yeah, and I, I put the email in the uh, the chat. So if you're interested in uh, in that project or uh, this one that I've pulled up, which Kevin, uh, I think he is on, if you want to talk a little bit about this project that we're doing in Alexandria. Yeah, hey, everyone. Uh, it's really good to be here with you tonight. Um, this project is uh, located in Old Town, Alexandria. Uh, I'm partnering with Dan and Carrie on this project uh, to bring this 10 unit condo to market uh, in the spring of next year. Uh, this is also a 10 unit condo uh, right in Old Town, Alexandria. Fantastic location, uh, about a block in from King Street, right where all the action is. Um, and it has um, a lot of amenities to it that are going to be very attractive to buyers, uh, such as uh, in Old Town. You know, parking is, a, is a, at a premium. Uh, this building has a parking lot to the right of it. So every unit will have parking. Uh, we have five two bedroom, two and a half bath units and five uh, three bedroom, two and a half bath units. And we have two penthouses with 500 square foot roof decks, with panoramic views of the Potomac, uh, looking south, uh, looking west, amazing sunsets and views. And then looking northeast to DC and monument views, great for fireworks. Excellent project, uh, 14 to 18 month project. Closing is gonna be in uh, early May. Uh, it also has two retail spaces on the first floor. Uh, so there's a lot of amenities to this building. Uh, there's not a lot of product that's gonna be coming out like this, which is a historical building, historical restoration and adaptive reuse. So that, that comes at a premium in Old Town. People, developers like to build new buildings that look and feel like this building, but we actually have the actual product. So. Uh, we're going to bring this to market next year. Um, you can visit it. Uh, you can check it out on the web. You can go to mvpequities.com and look at the project. Or you can contact Dan or myself. I'll put my email in the contact bar. And uh, you can reach out to us and get some more information if you're interested in uh, uh, investing in the project. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, if you, if you guys want uh, information, more information, or set up a call with me or Sunil or Kevin, just, just email uh, Dan at Live the Orange Line. I put it up in the chat. Be happy to talk more. Um, thought we actually did have that one slide. Yeah, I thought there was a slide coming on this. Right. <laughs> Got our order mechanist up a little bit. Uh, yeah, some more more information on the the the, Ches the Chesapeake project in uh, up up in Georgetown that Sunil um, mentioned earlier. This this one's closing soon, but. We've got a couple equity positions left if people want. And there's just a breakdown of the units here. You can see these are all, uh, except for the IZ zone pricing, these are all um, 
you know, in a good price range that we think will be pretty resilient uh, for what we're going through right now. Um, you know, you just don't get a lot of 400 to 600 K inventory mm -hmm. in this location for, for, you know, new stuff. So uh, if you guys, again, if you guys got questions on either of these, just, just email me. It's, it's in the chat uh, or Dan at live the orange line.com. Uh, for those of you who, um, you know, follow us on, on either YouTube or iTunes, uh, we've been doing our show for our, our agent show for a little bit over a year, but early, earlier this year, we started a, a different segment on the hyperfast agent. Uh, YouTube channel and podcast called Hyperfast Wealth. So at least once a week, we're talking strategy, doing interviews with other investors from all across the country. We, we break down some of our ongoing deals. So you can follow us at hyperfastwealth.com or just go to Hyperfast Agent YouTube channel. Um, so COVID-19, Carrie's is going to talk a little bit uh, about, you know, what, what our team has been seeing and, and um, what you guys should be thinking of as either agents or investors. So I know we got a mix of both on this channel. And if you have any specific questions on what you need to be thinking with COVID-19 going on, uh, please put them in the chat window. Uh, we will definitely get to your questions. Hey guys. Um, so I guess the first thing I would say is our mindset has always been what do we need to do to take care of our clients? And I think a lot of real estate agents just originally their reaction was, I'm going to go home and wait this out. And we all know at this point, we can't wait it out. And I was really happy to see the government deem us essential because there are a lot of people that actually have to make a real estate move. And so for us, we immediately started adapting what we were doing from a marketing perspective, from a sales conversion perspective to being virtual. And I think we were in a fortunate place where we were uh, small enough to be able to pivot fast. There's some big brokerages that told everyone to go home and that was kind of the end of the conversation. And I think they did that because of liability and I understand everybody's concerned about safety and how to protect themselves and we understand that but there are clients out there that they still have to make a move i can think of so many clients that i've helped over the years that they didn't have months to figure it out and that exists in the market today so that was our position hey we're here and we will serve you and we will take care of you and we will do it in a way that makes you feel comfortable. So we've sold some homes without people ever going inside. We've done everything virtually. We have one tenant that actually doesn't allow any showings, doesn't want anyone in the property. And he does a joint Zoom as the tenant with the listing agent, the buyer agent, and the potential client. So you can kind of see some of the results that Dan has here, 45 ratified contracts in the last two weeks. Um, the first, I like to talk about this because the very first week when everyone was saying they had no sales, our team did 29 sales, which was a record. The, the first week that everyone was in isolation, we were really focused on taking care of our clients that needed to secure housing. And so our position has always been, how do we help? So I really want to open it up to questions. Can we go ahead and take away the share for a second? Because I think there's probably some of you out there that do have questions. Hi, Chris. Um, so if any of you are feeling like, I'm not really sure how to navigate this. I have properties that are sitting and I don't know what else I should be doing. I just want to open it up to any questions you guys might have. Yeah, any questions? You just put them in the chat, right, uh, Dan? If any questions, just go and put them in the chat. Oh, there we go. Website is down, I believe. Which uh, website are you talking about? Um, I'm not sure, but we'll make sure we get you the link. That would be very strange if one of the websites was down. We'll check it out. Thanks, Ricardo, for letting us know. You guys have to have questions. Come on, be brave. Ask what's in your heart. This is an opportunity to talk to people who are navigating the storm and have a lot of, so, of people. So risk you're welcome. Okay, you're going to have to do it in the chat because it's too dangerous. We don't want to oh. accidentally hear something we're not supposed to hear. 
Um, what type of marketing or lead prospecting has proven to be most effective? Okay, thanks for asking. So the first thing that I would say is Dan and I's focus has been how do we catch leads further upstream? We've been looking at that for a while because we were able to get our cost per lead down. And you guys may remember me talking about this a little bit last week, right? But during this crisis, our goal is to collect the motivated people who are right now buyers. So we've pivoted our strategy a little bit and focused on the sources that tend to be a little bit closer to buying. So some of that for us is Zillow, Riller.com, the traditional sources. We find that people who are out looking at houses are the most serious about making a decision right now. So we've taken some of those leads that are less expensive and diverted some of the resources into the people who are right now. We've also done that from our um, ads for sellers. So we do those ads on Google and on Facebook, and we're still doing the home eval valuation tool that we told you guys about. We've found that there, it's very effective. We're continuing to generate leads at a rapid pace, and our appointments have not gone down because we've pivoted to doing virtual appointments. Now, the, another change we've made is we're, we're starting to focus a little bit more on uh, move up buyers and, and trying to create some ads and marketing around the need for a home office. And, you know, we do, who knows how long this will last or what will long-term changes will be, but I can see space at home being more of a premium because I think regardless of how long this lasts, you'll probably see more people working at home uh, on the other side of this because they were forced to do it for a month or two or however long this ends up being. So I think um, home office space could be a premium. So when you're, you know, thinking about condos, that two and then floor plan might make sense. Or if you're doing a, a flip and you can add a little bit of square footage, that, that might be more appealing than it, than it was prior to this. So that's, that's definitely a trend to, to look at, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people, I think that there's also this pent up demand that's developing where there's a lot of people in society that are like, you know what, who knows what's going to happen in the world. I do know this. I don't want to be where I am right now, right? If you talk to people right now, there's a lot of people having that reaction. And so I believe when this is over, the pent up demand is going to be so crazy. That's going to propel us into an even faster pace market. And I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. What other yeah, questions do you go ahead? Snap. I, I disagree with what you guys are saying too. I think that you know, we were kind of forced to go through this period of, uh, you know, working virtually and doing as much as we can virtually. But I think it's going to open people's eyes to how much you can do virtually. And it's going to be a long, long term effect of people doing, you know, not everything that we're doing now virtually, but maybe another 10 or 20%. So um, I think while, you know, we're all sitting at home in our whatever, either regular home office or makeshift office, I think a large percentage of people are going to be like, wow, I can do this, you know, even long term and it works out better because there's no traffic, no this, no that. So I, I think there will be some definitely lasting effects and changes uh, after we come out of this. Sunil, I'm really glad you said that because one of the things that I've been thinking as a real estate leader is, okay, the agents that think they can just wait and this will be over, right? it'll never be the same again. If that's right. in your head as an investor or an agent, it's just a bullshit thing because once they've been, once the public has been exposed to what it's like to have a virtual listing appointment or a virtual buyer's appointment, when you ask them to come out in the future and not have to do it, like come meet with us in our office, they're going to be like, why would I do that? Right. So I you think have to adapt. You have to change the way you're doing business because now consumers are working from home. Everyone knows how to use Zoom. For us that have been using Zoom for a long time, right? Dan too. <laughs> Despite um, for those of us that have been <laughs> <laughs> using before. Zoom for a long time, we, we saw the influx of all of these people from around the country, around the world using Zoom. They're not going to forget how to do it because it changes the way you have meetings and it's so effect effective, right? Yeah. So in my mind, you have to adapt. You have to change your process. You have to change your, your way of thinking about your business. And if you don't, you will be left behind. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, I know some of the stuff we were going to talk about is some construction updates and things like that. And certainly if you guys have more questions, please put them in there and we can kind of jump around here. Cause 
a little bit of a free form, a little, little different than our normal meetings. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, from the, you know, development, construction, investing standpoint, you know, definitely, you know, there's been an effect. I, I, there, you can't deny that there's no effect, but it really, in general, hasn't been that bad at all. I mean, we're still able to do construction. We're considered essential, so that hasn't really changed or stopped. All the agencies we work with, like DCRA in DC and the Arlington um, County, they're still doing stuff virtually. And interestingly, you know, kind of the point that we were, Karen and I were just talking about is, for example, like a small example is DC Water. They did, everything was paper. It was like the worst system where you're, they would send you everything. You had to go down there, pick up the plans, manually change them, and then actually li literally physically take them back down there. And they've shifted to virtual. So it's actually better for us now because I just had some plans today and I just emailed, we, we made all the changes. We emailed it to her, to the, to the, our contact there. She acknowledged it, said, Hey, I'll get back to you within the you know, normal time frame." So hopefully a, that's actually better for us. Well, actually, I'm sorry. A, it hasn't stopped the process at all. In fact, it's maybe accelerated it and B, hopefully that'll be some lasting change that some of these agencies will see that, you know, we can do a lot of this stuff virtually and we don't need people coming down and using paper, you know, plans and all that stuff. So I think, um, you know, oh, oh, that's why is that with me? Um, I think, um, you know, it, real estate is an industry that we're all in here is really, you know, relatively coming through this pretty good. We're still able to build, we'll still, we're still able to get our permits. We've still got great investment opportunities for those of you who are passive investors. We just showed you two of those right now. Um, that's one of the things we, we you know, as, as Grid Arlington, we're very committed to giving you guys some great passive, you know, investment opportunities. And I think we're still doing that. Uh, we're still selling. Uh, we sold a condo unit. I don't know. I don't think it was last Thursday. It was Thursday before. I've got two more units that are selling this Friday. So things are still selling. And, um, you know, uh, and we're, we're still looking at deals. I was, I was just at about four o'clock today. I was just looking at a deal for another project that we, we potentially might do. Uh, banks are also that they, they've probably been the the most change we've seen is with, with the banks because they're all focused on the new um, small business loans that are going out. But having said that, they're still working on our deals. Um, so we're still, you know, closing deals, buying properties. So again, you know, everything is moving and it's happening. And I think as Carrie was also alluding to is that you just have to go with, you know, do what you can right now. That's the bottom line. Don't think of reasons why you can't do stuff or focus on things you can't do, but focus on what you can do. And when you do that, you'll see that there's a lot, a lot that you can actually be doing, especially in real estate at this time. So Sunil, we have a couple questions that just sure. came up. Chris, I wanna address your question first. There's a few steps I would take before I would go active on the market. Um, I would do a virtual tour where you don't include the address and I would look up all of the buyer agents and listing agents that have represented people in the neighborhood and I would individually reach out to them and send them the virtual tour and find out if they have someone. Because right now is a time when there's a lot of buyers that just aren't finding what they want. And so you wanna build momentum for your listing. I would not, it, it depends on the motivation of the client, but for me, I feel confident that virtually we could do a lot to get the home sold. So I wouldn't hold back on starting to market it if the client's motivated and they have somewhere they need to be. Um, so feel free to ask other questions, but three things you can do to set the listing apart. Be more, be more grassroots with it. Find out who's sold in the neighborhood. Find out people who are liking the listing if you go active and be really aggressive in your follow-up. And then MAD report. It seems super simple. A lot of people were already doing that. We were already doing that. But it gives the people the ability to look like they're walking through the home very easy. We're doing live video and we're also doing Facebook lives. So we're just hammering that. The other thing that we've set up is a page that captures the information of the people before they see the virtual tour. We've done that because we realized, oh, we're losing opportunities for people who would normally come to an open house and we want to find the motivated people's information. So I would encourage you to set up something like that for your listing so you're still able to find out who are the motivated people who might want to buy this and a coming soon strategy, even though you have to be careful because you can't actually market the specific um, property address. There's a lot of people out there that are searching desperately right now. So you coming to their aid could put the deal together with very either completely virtual or very few showings. Um, so that's my thought on that. Anything you want to add? 
No, I've, I've got a thought on the, the next question about uh, will there be a increase in foreclosures? I think it depends on how long this lasts, and and um, but but I think probably not in the inner the, the close in market. So like Arlington, most of Fairfax, DC, um, you know, places where the homes are like four hundred and up. I, I don't see it having much of an effect. I saw a stat from McKinsey that said incomes of 70K and above are, are, are only about two and a half percent or so have lost their jobs in that price range, which in our market, most of the people are well above that, that threshold. So I think one of, one of the uh, sad trends, but good if you're in this uh, median, you know, home price or, or, or above, you know, either as an agent or investor, uh, one of the sad trends, depending on how you look at it, is the actions we're taking now are, are putting working class, lower class, more at risk financially and health wise, because most of the 70K and up jobs in the D, DMV area uh, have all just shifted to work from home. Mm -hmm. and, and there's graphs on this too. And, um, you know, most of the people in that, 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 that salary range and up are working from home. Uh, very few have lost their jobs. The people, you know, 50K and below, they're either losing their jobs, like restaurant, retail, or uh, they are still working, you know, like think Amazon distribution centers, grocery stores, all that kind of stuff. So I, th I think most of, of the markets that, that, that we serve close into DC, uh, you're probably not going to see a ton of foreclosures happen. Yeah, that's just that's what I'm seeing too, Dan. Exactly what you're seeing is that um, going kind of that next question is that I, I kind of got I'm, I've been trying to get out of the rental business because I really am more of a developer and I'm putting my assets and funds in there. But I still having said that I still have four renters and there's, you know, knock on wood been no issue with rent because they all have jobs that are they're just shifted to teleworking. In fact, I, you know, they, they ended up spending more time at home, which I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. But I think, yeah, exactly. I think if you're renting to folks, you know, in, the, in, the, in that type of job, under, we're going to have a lot of issues, may have to, you know, work with them to, to figure out some solution. But in our area, almost everybody we're renting to is 70K and above. And that's been my personal experience, too, is that we've had no issues with, with you know, they haven't even asked for any, you know, rent, uh, you know, they even brought the topic up. Uh, so that, yeah, just want to echo that's been my experience as well. And Sunil, I think um, the question about the rental is, should I list it with the tenants in place? And mm -hmm. in my mind, that's always a tough one because if you have cooperative tenants and you're able to incentivize them to clean up and handle showings well and that kind of thing, that's one thing. And showings can be virtual, right? So mm -hmm. if you have somebody who's willing to do a virtual tour, and the tenant is cooperative, that could be a fantastic opportunity to not have vacancy because it could take a little longer to sell right now. Right. So I would be the same strategy that I said a moment ago uh, to Chris, I would be testing the coming soon market. I would be networking to find other agents who may have a client and then educating the renters and creating some incentive for them if they can help it sell before, um, before it goes live on the market. If you had to put it live on the market, uh, I, I would still do that. I would just make sure that it's clean, it presents well, all of the things you would normal, normally do in any other market. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. All right, any other questions, guys? Uh, listing a tenant occupied home. I just talked about that. Just, yeah. Yep. Or, okay. Yep. Uh, private equity, we got someone on here that still lending. That's good. <laughs> nice, we love it. <laughs> Nice work. Yeah. Chris, Chris might need some. All right, I'm going off <laughs> camera, you guys. See you soon. All right, let's see ya. But, um... All right, so uh, just, just to wrap up COVID-19, I, th I think the big thing is to focus on the things you can control versus the things you, you cannot control. So you can't, you know, you can control your mindset, how hard you work, the innovation you do, the adaptation you do, 
you know, one of the things that, that helped us a lot was we immediately switched to Zoom uh, for our new new appointments for our buyer, you know, initial consults, our initial seller consults. Uh, we, we started doing virtual showings. We put out a training on how to do a virtual sales meeting. You can, you can find it on the Hyperfast Agent YouTube channel. We made it available to everyone. It was actually the most watched video we've made this year. Um, so it's beating out a lot of great uh, interviewers that, that we've had on or just, just because of the you know, timing and how applicable it is. Um, and question on those virtual showings, we're doing that by uh, sometimes video, sometimes FaceTime live, uh, which is really great because the client can kind of ask questions on the spot. And, um, you know, the agent can respond or show them the different things. Um, so just, just continue to focus on your mindset and innovating and adapting. Don't focus on the virus, the media, the lockdown, shutdown, economy, all of that. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Sunil. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm, I couldn't agree with what you're saying more. I mean, really, my entire focus has been what I can do, right? Uh, I think a lot of people are focused on what they can't do. Um, so it's just, just a matter of mindset. And I think a lot, there's a lot of things you can be doing now to prepare when everything gets opened back up. And if you're following the news at all, the last couple of days, every, the, the, the focus has been more on opening. They're already starting to talk about opening. There's plans coming out this week uh, from the federal level, as well as the, the regional governors are starting to talk about how to open things back up. So while I don't think, you know, we're going to be, we're certainly not going to be 100% open by May 1st. I think around May 1st, you're going to start seeing some kind of gradual opening. Um, so again, we can't predict whether this is going to be two or three more months of, of an effect or it could be longer, but I think we're already starting to see some positive signs. And again, it's just focused on what you can do today and what you can do today to prepare for another, you know, 30 to not to, you know, 60 days when we start seeing things, you know, coming back online. Uh, this isn't like a, you know, one year, two year, three year type of crisis. I think it will be measured in months. Uh, and that's where we need to just be prepared to, to come back. So that, that, that's, that would be my biggest, you know, advice, I guess. <laughs> All right. So uh, time for the regularly scheduled topic. Uh, <laughs> identifying motivated sellers and, and how to negotiate the deal. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the grid curriculum here, as well as kind of my take on my experiences and, and Sunil's over the years. So a motivated seller is going to be someone who has a financial reason or an emotional reason to sell a property for less than what the market could bear if the property was fixed up correctly, marketed correctly, and shown to, you know, shown to the market. So in my mind, the normal way of, of getting maximum value is to have the property at highest and best use in its best shape and condition and get as many people there. Um, some sellers are not motivated by maximizing profit. A lot there, there are some sellers that are motivated by something else in their life. They might want security of knowing they got a deal. They might want speed. Uh, they, they, they may just be emotionally done with the house. Uh, there's, there's a ton of reasons and, and that person's going to accept less money than full market value. And there's nothing, uh, you know, unethical or, or evil about it. In fact, I think those types of people, if you're a real estate agent that only has one solution, right? So a lot of real estate, a lot of agents have one solution and that solution is maximize profit, full marketing and all that. But some people that that's not their primary motivation. So if you're, if that's not their primary motivation, that's all you can offer. And if you don't have another path as a, an agent or investor, you know, you're not fully serving them. You are not, not solving their problem. All right. So circumstance and emotion, those are the two biggest motivators for someone to take less than full market value. 
if they're motivated by circumstance, uh, it, it, it could be a number of things. You know, common examples are the property is in terrible shape uh, and, and, you know, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to put the time and effort to, to fix it. Maybe they don't have the finances to, to do that. Um, you know, there could be external pressure to get the, the deal done fast. It could be like financial, it could be divorce, death, uh, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and it could be convenience. You see this a lot with, with the uh, first time renters, right? So, so people buy a house and then maybe they buy their next one, rent, rent the previous one. It turns over once and they freak out because all of a sudden their investment portfolio went from 100% uh, occupied to 0% occupied. And uh, a lot of people will sell that first time. So that's actually a good strategy in itself is to uh, contact landlords when, when you, know, you see their house for rent or you see their leases uh, come up. So number of different circumstances. Uh, emotion, all right? A lot of times emotion can play a role in getting a good deal. So the seller may, may not have, again, they may not have the time and money. They might be embarrassed by the condition of the, the property. Um, you know, there, there, there can be uh, a divorce or death can, can lead to it being an emotional reason as well. Uh, maybe the tenant trashed the place. All, all sorts of things can just make them tired of dealing with it. Like it's, you know, they don't want to spend any more emotional energy on it. Uh, anything you might add to, to the kind of circumstance or emotion, Samia, from, from what you've seen? Um, yeah, I think um, really I, my comments would be more a little bit of a, at a higher level, is, which involve, you know, account for everything you've just said is really just you kind of figure out what this person wants, like what's their motivation. Um, in, in the prior slide, I talked about solving their problem. It's the same, you can use the same language, you know, solving their problem or what's their motivation. And I, I'm still, I mean, I've, I mean, it's probably thousands of deals I've looked at and tried, attempted to negotiate over my career. Um, and I still work with agents and it's amazing how they already make assumptions on what the other side wants. Uh, a great one is like closing time frame, for example. You know, we always, you know, you know, you know, Dan, you and I, we always try to get the longest closing time frame because that's less money out of our pocket and we have more time to analyze the property, get plans done, things like that. And I've worked with agents where I'm like, oh, let's, let's ask for 90 days. They're like, oh, it's just, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm like, I, I push them to ask for 90 days and then all of a sudden, oh, so yeah, no problem. We'll do 90 days. <laughs> um, so I think not assuming that every, like you said, everybody's motivated by money. Everybody's motivated by this. The key is, um, you know, finding out what that person really is motivated by, um, whether it's emotion or circumstance or whatever it is. Um, I'll, if, you, if you'll indulge me just for a sec, I'll tell you one story. I think this was like maybe 10 years ago. I went out to buy a car, a brand new car, and, uh, or a, a car, not a brand new one. Um, and it was interesting because um, I have four kids and at the time they were very young. And um, I've always believed in like a Chevy Suburban. I think that's like the best, safest car for kids in my opinion. Uh, so I had a Chevy Suburban, I was, I was going to the airport and I was, I, as I was leaving for the airport, I looked at our old Suburban and it just, it just didn't look safe. The tires were worn, it just was beaten up. And at that moment I said, I'm, as soon as I get back from this trip, I'm buying a new Suburban because I don't want my kids in this, what I felt was an unsafe car. So I got back, I went to the dealership and I, um, I kind of, well, I kind of identified one I already wanted and I went to the dealership and, you know, typical car salesman, you know, doing his thing, kind of half listening to me, half not. We're going for a test drive and he's just, oh, hey, you know, what do you do for a living? Just a standard nonsense. Not at all asking me, well, why do you want this car? And for him, if he would have just, just asked me that simple question, he very easily would have got out of me, it's safety. I just want my kids to be safe. And all he had to do is just kept telling me how safe a Suburban is, and I would have bought the car immediately. So it's just, you know, if you're negotiating or trying to work with a person, it's just finding out what they're after. In that story I just told, I was just after safety for my kid. That's all I cared about in that, you know, I didn't care about the fuel economy or the size of the engine or the towing capacity or all those other things that Suburbans are known for. Um, I just cared about safety. So again, when you're looking to buy a property or sell a property, just see what is this person really after. And once you identify that, you just work with whatever you're given. 
So that that's kind of what I think is at the heart of all negotiation, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree uh, completely. Like it's it's about solving their problems and you know, the slides would make it think that it's, it's like always negative and sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they just want additional safety security like Sunil mentioned. Sometimes it could be someone that wants to move up to a really awesome house or they, right. they, they just had kids or got married or whatever it is, right? So they need more room. And um, they, they need the house sold so that they can get that, that new house uh, sooner. Um, yeah, so yeah. sometimes it's, it's like an ego purchase, like you said, they you know, they don't really need a new house, but they just want a bigger, nicer house to show off to their friends. If that's what you've gotten out of them, work with that and tell them how awesome this house is and how awesome they're going to look in front of their friends and how cool parties they can have. <laughs> it's whatever you're given, work with that. Uh, you know, I think that's really the heart of all sales, essentially, and negotiation. Yeah, and if, if they're, uh, Motivated by circumstance, they need the house sold. If they're motivated by emotion, it's it's going to be typically they, they want the house out of their life, whether it's they need it out of their life because it's a negative emotion or a positive emotion, they need it out of their life so they can buy their next place. Um, but again, it all comes down to just finding out the why and, and the reason behind the reason. It may take questions to get to that and then can you solve that problem? So the other, the other point before we move on to the yeah. topic is, yeah, again, I think the number one thing is just, again, figure out that why, what are they, what are they after? In my case, it was safety. The kind of example you gave, it was just made for an ego thing. They just wanted a bigger house to impress whoever, their friends, their parents, their ex-wife, whatever. <laughs> um, the other thing I think is kind of see what position you're in once you're in the negotiation. And I think that's also helped me a lot in deals. We had one recently, if it was kind of a complex deal where there wasn't a lot of options for the seller. He had to sell. I knew he was under stress financially. And um, he had a loan where it was like a hard money loan. So I knew he was bleeding every month and he wanted this deal done. And it wasn't like he had 12 options to go sell them to different people. So we were able to really, really kind of negotiate that down and really get a very, very good price. Versus if you're in a situation where, you know, you're buying a property, let's just say for a million bucks and you know, the deal works at a million for you, but you know, obviously you'd like to get it at 900, but if, if you know that person has options and they've got a bunch of people lined up the door to buy this deal, don't mess with it. Just take it at a million and try to get the deal under contract. So I think it's understanding what position the other person is in. That's another huge part of getting these deals done successfully. Um, you know, in the, the stuff we're talking about today is, you know, let's say we're buying a, buying a house that has, you know, three, three brothers and sisters, mom just died, they're all scattered across the United States. Again, figuring out what position are they in? Are they willing to hold this property for long term, or not long term, but willing to hold it in order to get a better price? Or are they just like, look, I hate my brothers and sisters, I just want this thing sold, I don't get along with them, I just want this thing done then you could step in probably and get a lower price as long as you can execute quick and, and solve their problem. So again, I don't know if that makes sense, but the best way I can say is just kind of what position is the other side in. Once you know that and you get a feel of it, then you can act accordingly. You can be more aggressive if you think you've got something, some leverage. If you don't, then you got to kind of, you know, go with what you got. Yeah, I, I, I agree. We're going to get a, you know, a little bit to that now on how to, how to find out uh, what their motivations are, what their timing is. Um, so, you know, last time or two, two, two meetings ago, we talked a lot about marketing and lead gen. So when someone calls and responds to your marketing or your prospecting, you know, first, you, you got to be friendly but you still want, you want to establish yourself as the expert. And this is the same thing we teach our listing agents on the team, by the way, is, you know, a lot of people just focus on rapport, 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 building rapport, but you know, you want these people to like you, but you want to be seen as the authority on getting that home sold or solving their problem, uh, not, a friend, right? So, so although, uh, you know, 
being on friendly terms is is great if you're just a friend and not an authoritative person you know an authority figure an expert in their mind uh you're you're not gonna have the confidence uh from them or, or they're not gonna have the confidence in you to to get the you know the deal done um so you gotta be friendly but authoritative and it's it's really all about determining motivation, right? Determine their timing and their motivation. So how do you do that? Uh, you ask, you ask open-ended questions, you know, how did you hear about us? Why did you call? Why are you selling? You know, have, have you, have you been talking to other agents? Um, you know, what's the condition of the house? Uh, what, what needs to be done to, to get it sold? You, know, you can ask about the mortgage, the liens, that kind of stuff. Um, when do you need to sell? Or, or in the ideal, you know, ask them like in the perfect world, when would you have, when would you, you know, close on this house with the buyer if everything was perfect, right? And then tell them, uh, ask them about price. You have to ask about, about, you know, what they think the market value is or the value they want, right? So, so you know, ask them up front. How much do you think you know, your house would, would sell for or how much do you want to get uh, don't don't shy away from the price uh, question I know some people feel awkward about it um, there's a number of different ways you can you can ask that if you feel uncomfortable but you know one way is to say look most people that call us have a number in mind and, and it helps to you uh, and it helps us to find the right solution when we know what number you need. Because depending on that number, by the way, like if if their number is like a hundred percent of market value, then you need to be prepared to to list the home for them if if they're an agent or or refer it to a an agent if if you're not one. So you know that that question is going to determine your approach if it's. You know, if they need like 85%, maybe it's a quick flip. If they, if they need yeah. 65, 70%, maybe it's something that's, that's a, a build, a bigger remodel. So uh, you need to find, find out uh, what that is. You can ask, you know, kind of how it says here. Another good way is to say in a perfect world, when would you close and what would the number be? Like yeah. it's, that's just a, a great way to kind of start it off and let them, let, you know, let them set that, that, that parameter to begin with. Yeah. I think Dan, it, I mean, to me, the biggest thing is literally just ask, just ask a simple open-ended question. You'd be surprised how many people won't ask again, like the car dealer that I was dealing with that day, didn't even ask, you know, so, so, uh, you know, Sunil or so Mr. Saxon, you know, why are you buying this car? Well, what's your reasoning? That simple question, I would have been like, I would have told him my whole story. <laughs> um, I remember, you know, another house, we sold a brand new house. It was, I think, two, three years ago now. And I wasn't involved with the sales transaction, but I met the buyer just before he closed. And his motivation was even, he even told me without even asking, uh, he, he was living in a small rambler, you know, the small ramblers we have in, in Arlington and him and his wife were both professionals making good money and they had six children and they were just dying to get into a big house that actually had room. And, you know, if I was involved with the sales process earlier, if I would just ask him, you know, what's the reason for your purchase? He would have immediately told me that. And all I would have talked about is, oh my God, you know, look how big this house is. Look how big these rooms are. Look at all, you know, you can have an extra bedroom for your office, for your hobbies, for your gym. You have a home theater here. So you just play up to, once you know their motivation, you just play that, play up to that card, you know? Uh, and it's really as simple as asking. I'd say maybe less than 5% of people that you interact with are going to be so guarded that they just aren't going to answer a question. But 95% plus people, if you just say, hey, you know, why are you selling or what's, you know, simple open-ended question, they're going to open up and tell you they're probably more than you ever want to know their whole life story. <laughs> and, and DJ's got a great comment here about reminding them of, of their pain, their motivation, whatever problem they're trying to solve. And, yeah. and this is why up front, you want to understand timing and motivation because when you get to the end of a, and, and you're ready to set an appointment or you're ready to make an offer you want to tie it back to that that pain that that you're going to solve either moving them away from pain or to, or moving them towards pleasure it's going to be one of those 
two things like, you know, away from pain is going to be out of a bad financial situation or emotionally bad situation, you know, towards pleasure would be helping them move up, retire, move somewhere else. Right. So you, you need to remind them of that motivation uh, when you get to the offer phase, appointment setting phases. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So if, if, their number works for you as an investor, you're going to want to make an offer. If, if it doesn't, if it's too high, you're, you're either going to want to list it, you know, as an agent or refer it to someone that, that, that can. And, uh, and um, you know, if, if, if it is an offer, you, you want to move fast. Like if you have a good deal, you don't want to sit on it. So hopefully you've got standard offer, uh, you know, forms uh, available. Uh, you want to you want to start right away. Uh, a good rule of thumb for an investor is is uh, you you want the, the price to to have uh, you know enough margin to make make sense. We currently shoot for twenty five uh, percent margin, which which typically is going to mean seventy percent of ARV minus the cost of renovation because there's there's always going to be other costs that uh, you know we want to buffer. Um, so 70% of the after renovation value minus, uh, the cost, uh, is, is a good, um, is, is a good, uh, rule of thumb. Another, another key point when you're negotiating is when you make an offer and this, this is the true, whether it's like making an offer to buy a place, making an offer to, to represent someone as a buyer or seller. Like if you're an agent, uh, when you ask the question, your closing question, uh, shut up after you ask it. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of times people will break silence because it's awkward. So that's why you see that, that line in there, next one to speak loses. A lot of times if, if you ask someone a question and they're kind of on the fence and you just sit there and shut up, they're going to, they're going to say the answer you want just to break the silence. Very, very weird, but, but true thing. So be comfortable with the silence after you ask your closing uh, question. And if, if, if the number that they give you is, uh, is, is close to what you think might work, you need to make an appointment to, to, to give yourself a chance to, uh, wrap up the deal. And last point, like I've mentioned before, if the number doesn't work for you, see if it would work for a different investor, see if it would work for, uh, uh you know, listing it or referring it to an agent. Um, anything else you'd add on, on that, that, that offer phase, setting the appointment phase, Samuel? You know? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a discipline of saying, you know, look, I'm going to, th this number is, is my max number that works for me. Right. Um, and not, you know, again, that example I gave, Hey, this, if I buy this property a million bucks, it makes money for me. It, it, it's a good deal for me. If that guy bought it for $300,000, he's making $700,000 on it. You don't need to sit there and say, well, I'm going to try to get it for 900 if he's got a line out the door of people that want it. Just take the deal, move on, make money. And versus if the deal just doesn't make sense for you at a million, then just don't do the deal. <laughs> just move on and do something else. So I think it's kind of knowing what your offer is, being pretty certain that this is my kind of max number or the number I'm willing to pay based on the circumstances and kind of sticking to it. Uh, I think that's, you know, and having that confidence to say, look, this is the number. Uh, a lot of times you'll get deals just because you're like you're saying, being authoritative and saying, this is kind of what I can do. Uh, so yeah, that, that'd be my biggest advice there. Yeah, and uh, oh, another great point by, by uh, DJ here, when, when you do uh, set the appointment, make sure all the decision makers are, are there. If, if there's two people that are gonna, um, you know, need to sign off or multiple, if it's an estate kind of deal, like you gotta make sure everybody is there. Cause the last thing you want is to get the deal with, you know, that, that, was, that one person says they'll take and then they go back to their, their spouse or whoever it is. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you don't have a deal. Um, and make sure that they have the authority to, to sign for the deal too. So um, this is gonna be more uh, common if it's like an estate sale or something like that, but you just wanna make sure that they actually 
are are able to sign a contract with you. Uh, so when you're at the house, uh, you know you want to reaffirm reaffirm the questions you discussed on the phone. Uh, inspect the home more, especially if it's going to be like a renovation or flip. If if you're just going to tear it down, it's not going to matter as much. But you want to ask them questions about the home. You know how how long certain problems have, have uh, existed um, and, and then make, make your offer. And uh, the best, best, uh, best offers in this situation are typically going to be, uh, you know, no contingencies, no repairs, quick closing, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, no financing contingency have the contract with you ready to go, have a lockbox uh, available so uh, you know you can get access, um, have, have your contractors start looking at it during the inspection uh, period if, if you have any or, or prior to closing. And um, if you are potentially gonna wholesale it or have other partners, you know, explain to them that you might have another partner. Uh, at the closing and not you. So make sure they know that up front. Um, seller psychology. Um, yeah, I, I kind of like this point too, that the negative uh, selling where, where you get them to, to, to really show that they are motivated by, you know, kind of giving them options other than uh, a, a quick sale. So if you, uh, you know, tell them like, hey, this, this, this looks like a nice house. Or if you're on the phone, this sounds like a really great house. Like, why do you want to sell it? Why do you want to uh, get rid of it quickly? Like get, you know, ask questions like that, that are going to be disarming and, and help them put their guard down, help them open up. Uh, if, if, um, you know, you, you suspect that they might be holding back. So that this is a great way, a great technique to get them to sell you on why you should buy the house from them. Mm -hmm. Anything, anything else that you want to add, Sunil? Yeah, I mean, this is you know, it's, it's again, it's sales, you know, basic sales techniques. Where I think anybody who on the who's on the um, the, the, the Zoom call here, you know, if they've been experienced in sales for a while and they've been successful at it, not just experienced, but successful at it, they understand that, you know, a lot of sales is just reading psychology, reading people. So you, you can tell right away if, you know, the motivation level of a person just when you start to talk to them. You know, if they immediately try to start selling you on the house, then you almost have to take the position like, oh boy, I don't know. You know, you, you become the um, kind of decision maker. Like, Oh boy, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of repairs. It's going to cost a lot of money, and all they're going to do is keep trying to sell you and sell you, and that's where you're going to get a price advantage when time comes to discuss the price. You know, versus if they've, you know, if you ask questions. One thing, I, I used to have a painting company when I very first started in real estate. And we used to go into people's houses and sell them, you know, paint painting uh, services, and we'd always try to establish, you know, art without kind of overtly asking, like, you know, oh, have you gotten other bids? And we know right away have they if they've gotten you know oh yeah we've, we've you know have three other guys in here to give bids we already know that now we're competing really because they need the paint work done right so in this case they need to sell the house so are you competing against other buyers or are you just really competing with so something else right so it's just establishing their psychology and where they're coming from and you know if they, you know, have three other bids that we're basically really focused on why we're a better painting company than everybody else out there. That's what we focus our, our presentation on versus if they said, Oh no, you know, we just, we've heard you're good. And we just want to get a bid from you. Then we more focus on our bid and, and our process and our paint quality and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, the word psychology is probably the most important word on this slide is really, if you want to be good at this and there, there's certain people that get really good at this and seem to always close deals. There's certain people that just can't seem to ever close a deal. And I think the difference really is people who can read other people and really understand psychology and, you know, work with what, what you're given, uh, understand where you're at in the negotiation and then be able to react in real time accordingly. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a very important part of this is the psychology. Yeah, I agree. That's why, you know, we, we didn't, we tried to stick away from like telling, like teaching a certain script or anything like that. I think it's, there, there are some techniques, but it's more about the overall strategy of, and, and kind of a, just, just asking the right questions to understand their motivation, their timing, and then how do I solve that problem for them? Right, exactly. And having as many potential solutions in your pocket as possible because everyone is going to have a different problem. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So, but before we kind of wrap up uh, negotiating the deal, you know, how, how, to, how to work with sellers, um, if, if you guys have questions about that, please put them in the chat. Uh, in the next couple minutes, we are going to experiment with breakout rooms. I don't know if anyone's used this feature in Zoom, but we're going to just randomly uh, create, I think, rooms of like six or five and uh, just give you guys um, a few minutes, uh, maybe, maybe five, six, seven minutes uh, to network in a smaller group with like five or six other people and, and that should be enough time for everyone to introduce themselves and, and kind of tell you know if they're an investor an agent flipper wholesaler uh, bank and, um, and and just kind of maybe share what you've been doing in the last 30 days with your business and, and what kind of you know help you could use so uh, we will break up into some breakout rooms in just two minutes but i'll give you guys another minute or two while i'm setting that up to just pop any questions you have about working with sellers working with sellers in this market uh, before we do that and then after we do that we'll, we'll come back to wrap up just for a few minutes so uh, so don't go anywhere uh after, you know once we go to the breakout rooms we will we'll, we'll all come back as well but um Next meeting is going to be, I believe it's May. It is May. I'll tell you right now. May 12th. May 12th. Yeah. Hopefully May. we'll be live. Hope to see everybody in person. Yeah, hopefully live. If not, we'll do this format again or a variation of it. Uh, so RSVP to that, regardless uh, of, of if it's virtual or in person. Um, obviously, uh, Hopefully you connected some through the breakout rooms. If you if you want to look at any of the deals we presented in more detail, you can email me. I'll, I'll put my email in the chat again in case you guys missed that. Um, so that's there. Hopefully you'll see us. Yeah, a little bit of an echo there, but hopefully you'll see us next month. If and uh, please uh, go to hyperfastpodcast.com or or check us out on on my hyperfast agent YouTube channel. Uh, we've we've been interviewing more investors and 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 people in the the DMV area, and, and, and so you'll get tips on what you know they're doing and to to react to all of this. So so check out the podcast show. Uh, either on iTunes or on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, okay. I think that is, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Yeah. One, one other suggestion, I guess I saw here in the chat, which is a good idea. Other, meetups I've participated in. We did three or four rounds of networking. So if you, if you guys like that format uh, in the breakout rooms, we can, we can do that a couple, couple times on the, on the next meeting. If we're still virtual, maybe uh, mm -hmm. one, once or twice in the beginning. And then again, at the end, um, just to give people a little bit more chance to, to meet more people virtually. Yeah, we might be able to do the beginning like we normally do and then just do like 10 or 15 minutes of that or something before we start. I like that that beach uh, background that uh, that, that you Yeah, know. do you like my ghost son popping in? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty uh, <laughs> that's pretty funny, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, great suggestion by the way on on adding uh, more rounds of networking we we, we kind of wanted to test it out for the first time make sure it, it worked and people liked it so we'll 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 do that more because I, I i enjoyed it as well just the small group i was in so yeah all right very good all right everybody well thank you for joining us and um we'll see you next time thank right. you be thank safe you. everyone yep thank you everybody take care we'll see you hey guys thanks for sticking around to the end if you want to see more videos like this click right here and if you want 10 tips from sunil and i on how we've built wealth through real estate click right here to download them instantly and if you're new to the channel Click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And let me know in the comments what you think about the videos. I read them weekly and I pick winners at random. And I give out stuff like hats, shirts, coaching calls with me, and tickets to some of our events. I'll see you next time.